And a very warm welcome to um, a course on forecasting in healthcare. So uh, in this first lecture, uh, we're going to talk through uh, what can be forecast in healthcare, what are the types of variables you might be forecasting. Um, we're going to look at the process of forecasting, what steps are involved in a typical forecasting project. I'll give you some practical advice there. We're going to be introduced to time series data. What does that look like itself? What, have you ever seen a time series before? Um, and then our first venture into forecasting is going to be using something called benchmark forecasts. And these are simple forecasting approaches that you should always apply first to your data to see what sort of accuracy you will get before moving on to anything sophisticated. And then lastly, we'll look at how do you measure how good a forecast is. And you absolutely have to include this in any forecasting stu study. Otherwise, you really don't know um, how well you're doing at all. Uh, so before we go anywhere, I, I just want to warn you that forecasting the future is very difficult indeed. Um, and it's difficult for a number of reasons. One is that the future is in inherently uncertain. We don't know what's going to happen and no clever mathematical method is ever going to be able to tell us exactly what happens. But secondly, the, the um, approach to forecasting and some of the tools within it are also fairly complex from a statistical point of view. Um, so we're going to try and have a gentle introduction to some of those today. So what does a forecasting project look like? What are the steps involved in it? Um, well, with any, any modelling problem, the first thing we need to do is define the project itself. Um, so what are the things that we need to forecast and how are they going to be used within real world decision making? There has to be some sort of data collection. Uh, so typically in a quantitative forecasting project, that data will have already been collected. However, it may need to be pre-processed in some way to turn it into a time series that's usable within a forecasting context. Um, I'd always recommend some exploratory analysis to start off with, and we'll be looking at how we can do that in Python later on. Um, so how do we visualise our data um, and how do we explore some of the key time series characteristics of that data? And then there's a there's a, a sort of a chunky phase to the project where we're fitting and trying um, different candidate forecasting models. So there's many, many approaches to forecasting. Um, uh, some are relatively straightforward, some are hugely complex. Um, and we never know what the best forecasting model is going to be for our particular data set. Um, so we may have a, um, a number of methods that we like to explore in practice that we know well. Um, and what we would do is we would try those methods and see how well they do at forecasting and select the best one. And we would use that as our forecasting model in practice. To do that, we need to understand how we evaluate and select the best model. And I'll talk you through some processes to, to do that. Uh, and we also need to understand how we generate the forecast. What does a forecast look like in practice? And it might look a bit different than what you expect. So what can we forecast? Uh, well, here's a few examples. Um, so we've talked previously about um, call centres being something you could perhaps model with discrete event simulation. Well, call volumes are uh, a quantity that are collected over time. So you could, of course, extrapolate in some way about how many calls you might get at a particular time of day uh, or on a particular day of week or month of year. Um, and that can be used for planning. So you could use that for determining your staffing levels. It might be something um, uh, physical. So it might be it might be a quantity of inventory. You need to forecast how much of this type of inventory do you need on a particular date. Um, it might be the number of patients that are attending um, an outpatient clinic um, over, over months of the year. You might want to do a yearly forecast to figure out what your demand is going to look like, again, for sort of scheduling the resources that are available. 
or it might be looking at um, elective operation demand. So you may have many types of elective operation that are conducted within a hospital and you may want to think individually about the demand for the different types of um, operation that there are and what that would look like over time. That's the key thing is what does it look like over time. And of course we can model and forecast the spread of a disease. Um, now this is extremely complicated and it's slightly outside of the scope of um, the methods we're going to look at today. Um, I will briefly uh, touch on this on the next slide. Um, so with every forecast of all of these examples, I've talked about forecasting over time. Um, so the technical language we're talking about here is a forecast horizon. Um, so we may only be looking a few minutes into the future. Um, if outside of the operational side of, of forecasting, you might be looking at um, medical uh, devices and forecasting what they're going to be outputting over a period of minutes. Um, or you might be looking, more likely be looking in terms of hours, weeks, months or years. So uh, back to why forecasting can be quite difficult. Um, so some things are easier to forecast than others. Um, so the things that affect this are, uh, so we're largely going to be dealing with um, single time series today, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. But there may be many factors which contribute to um, an observation in practice. Um, so the weather is a good example that might be affecting, for example, admissions to hospital in winter differently from how it affects admissions to hospital in summer. Um, some of these methods are extremely data hungry, so they require quite long time series in order to pick up the intra-year, intra-day, intra-week um, variability and patterns that are there. So if you haven't got much data, you're not going to be able to use a very sophisticated method. Um, you might end up using a very, a fairly simple method and that might affect how far into the future you can forecast accurately. And the other, the last thing really, which is a, it's a really big thing is, is whether the forecasts affect the thing that we are trying to forecast. Um, so for example, if we think the NHS is going to be overloaded by COVID and we've built forecasting models of whatever type to predict that, um, then we're going to take actions to try and stop that. So we'll never know if our forecasts were correct or not. So when I've worked on practical projects in forecasting, it usually starts with a question like this. Um, so I would like to know if it's possible to forecast, whatever, insert your favourite thing, the number of chocolate biscuits that McVitie's is going to sell next week. Um, well, the answer is nearly always yes. Yes, you can forecast it. Um, but that's not the full picture. Um, so one way to forecast it would just be take your average sales of McVitie's chocolate biscuits. Um, and that would, be, that would be something you would carry forward and that would be a prediction. But it may not be a very good forecast. So usually I have to ask a set of questions back to the decision maker. Um, so the first one is, is obviously what, what are your decisions that you're going to make using these forecasts? Are these short term operational decisions? Are these big decisions, like some sort of big strategic decision that you need to make? Um, or is this some sort of resource planning thing over the long term and you want to get a long feel for what your demand is going to look like over a year? Um, how many things do you need to forecast? Are you forecasting um, a single metric or are you forecasting many? Um, so for example, if you're forecasting um, demand at an accident, accident and emergency department, are you just forecasting total demand? Or are you forecasting um, demand broken down by condition, age group? Um, so you really need to get to the heart of what it is. Um, and again, this is going back to what decisions the forecasting will support. Um, so you may be able to forecast the total number of people attending an emergency department very accurately, but if that doesn't support any decisions, that's not much use to anyone. Um, and then going back to that question about can I forecast, you know, what's underlying that is what accuracy is needed to support those decisions, because you could use the mean, um, 
but the mean might be so far out that actually it's it's useless for supporting decisions. So that's quite a difficult question to for a decision maker to answer actually, um, because they've often not thought through um, what sort of accuracy do I need. How far ahead do you need to forecast? Sometimes that's an easy question to um, to answer. Um, so, for example, if you're an ambulance service and you plan to your rotors a certain number of weeks or months ahead, um, you'll need forecasts to go along with those with that planning. Um, and, and from a technical side of view, the uh, a, a forecaster needs to know about the frequency of the data. Is it weekly data? Is it monthly data? Is it data recorded at the hour that we need to pre-process into a daily or weekly? Um, so we need to understand what does that data look like. If people are interested in forecasts at a daily level, but they only have monthly data, then you can't provide that information to them. And then lastly, how frequently are forecasts needed? Um, how often do you need to run your forecast and need to make to make a decision? So this is this is a different type of model than maybe what we've looked at before. These are models that are used routinely. They're used again and again and again to support decision making. So my a really big piece of advice, probably my best advice I could give you for any modeling project actually, is to make sure you spend time talking to the people who need to make the decisions and who need that forecast information before doing any analysis and modeling. Spend some time talking to them and sketching out and structuring that problem. So this course will be focusing on quantitative time series forecasting. So this brings in some of the concepts that we've talked about before. So we're looking at fre you know, frequency of data. So the monthly number of patients that are conveyed by ambulance to an emergency department, the daily number of patients admitted to a hospital with respiratory conditions. So we've got a frequency and we've got a subgroup of the population there. Or something like the quarterly sales of toilet rolls in the UK um, in the middle of a pandemic. So we can apply this type of forecasting where it's safe to assume that historical patterns will continue into the future. That's not always the case. And a lot of time series forecasting for the next three years will be plagued by a rather big kink around March in the UK.